Until recently, salamanders, frogs, turtles, lizards, and snakes have not received the same research attention as wildlife which is harvested by the public, such as game fish, deer, and elk. Increased concern about the future of amphibians and reptiles, collectively known as herptofauna, has prompted several agencies to fund research and habitat enhancement on a variety of endangered or vulnerable species. Hi, I'm your host, Cam Gillis. My interest in herptology, the study of amphibians and reptiles, began at an early age, so I was pleased to be invited to participate in this documentary. It's the product of a special partnership between the Columbia Basin Trust, Living Landscapes, the Royal BC Museum, and Shaw Cable. Our goal is to introduce you to some of the threatened or little understood amphibians and reptiles which comprise the living landscape of the Columbia Basin. Amphibians were the first to evolve from prehistoric fish. Fossil records date back 395 million years ago and resemble fish, but also have completely developed legs and lungs. They were equally at home in water and on land. There were many varieties, some with strange shapes we no longer see today. As they evolved, their skin became glandular. This moist, permeable skin allowed both oxygen and water to enter the amphibian's body, an adaptation which allowed the animal to hibernate underwater during especially dry or cold weather. Unlike reptiles, amphibians have a larval stage of development. They lay gelatinous eggs in or near water, which support the development of fish-shaped larvae. These larvae usually transform or metamorphose as fully formed adults. This dependence on water may be the key to current problems for all amphibians. In the last 10 to 15 years, researchers around the world have started noticing amphibian declines. There are a variety of possible causes, but some of them include habitat loss, increased ultraviolet radiation due to thinning of the ozone layer, global warming, introduced species such as fish or bullfrogs, diseases, and pollution. It is estimated by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature that approximately one quarter of the world's amphibian species are at risk of extinction. Let's take a look at our first amphibian and the Canadian biologist who is breaking new ground with her findings. Penny Ohanjanian is studying the red-listed or endangered Coeur d'Alene salamander in the West Kootenays. So few of them have been found that biologists are concerned important habitat and the only BC population could inadvertently be destroyed. Penny's objective was to determine the full extent of the BC population and their habitat requirements. Field biologists often have to adapt to their target species habits, so Penny and her team work on warm rainy nights, the time the Coeur d'Alene salamander prefers to hunt insects and worms. Southeastern British Columbia is the only place in Canada in which the Coeur d'Alene salamander is found. This species, a member of the plethodont family, has no lungs. As a result, it is required to live in moist microenvironments. The water that surrounds the salamander allows gas to cross the skin, therefore allowing them to respire. This species lives in waterfall splash zones and rock seepages.
Penny's team found that these splash zones by waterfalls or creeks were crucial. The aerated water provides the Coeur d'Alene salamander much needed oxygen as it passes over their bodies. Fractured rock and rock seepages also seem to be important. The team found evidence that the salamanders were using these fissures to go below the frost line in the freezing temperatures of winter and in summer they used them to avoid desiccation or loss of body moisture. Penny explains the Coeur d'Alene's reproductive phases and how they differ from another BC salamander. Many of you may be familiar with the common long-toed salamander. This species is seen frequently in basements and under logs. It is different from the Coeur d'Alene salamander, however, in several respects. The long-toed salamander lays eggs in the water. These hatch and young larvae swim about the ponds for the summer. In the fall, they metamorphose into, into mature-looking salamanders and become terrestrial. The Coeur d'Alene salamander, however, does not have an aquatic larval stage. The females lay their eggs in masses in rock crevices that are moist. When these eggs hatch, miniature adult-like salamanders emerge. The species was first discovered in British Columbia in the early 1980s. Researchers who were studying daddy longlegs found them in a wet seep in a mine shaft. Since that time, we have found them in 18 different locations. While this sounds like a large number of places, the species cannot be considered common. They're in fact quite rare, and their numbers appear to be very low at these sites. Penny's team hopes that they will continue to find more sites where the Coeur d'Alene salamander is thriving. Her team's work has already served a valuable function. By identifying these splash zones with particular rock types, others will be able to assist in protecting the Coeur d'Alene salamander in British Columbia. Someday, we may be able to remove it from the BC endangered species list. Frogs and salamanders are believed to have evolved from a common ancestor. Frogs eventually lost their tails and their rear legs enlarged and enabled them to swim faster, jump to evade predators, and travel longer distances to preferred habitat. Tailed frogs are one of the few frogs that still have a modified tail and muscles to control it. They also have skeletal ribs and nine vertebrae, characteristics which few other frogs share. Purcell Mountain Range of southeastern BC, a doctoral candidate and her research team have found a geographically distinct species of tailed frog. Preliminary tests of this isolated interior population of the tailed frog have geneticists speculating that it may be a new species. Field data up to 1984 indicated that this high mountain frog had been found primarily in the southwestern portion of the province. Linda Dupuis began her work in the early 90s and has discovered that there is a significantly larger population of these BC interior tailed frogs than was previously known. Unlike most frogs, the tailed frog requires clear, fast flowing water from high mountain streams. Linda also found that the rock type in the stream bed was crucial. Okay, um, these frogs are quite fascinating, but because their, pot, their distribution, um, from what I can see from my research, seems to indicate that geology is an important factor. Geology in terms of rock type. Um, if you have soft rocks that tend to break down very easily into fine sediment, sand and pebbles, then those creeks are often uh, indicative of streams that are, are not settled those stable creeks with the anchored boulders are, are definitely the ideal creek for tailed frogs. In this one area where we found the tailed frog, there's a, a mix of rock and it's, there are pools and riffles and, and the gradient is low enough that the creeks appear to be stable, which is very important because the uh, tadpoles take several years to metamorphose into frogs and so they have to overwinter in these creeks 
one or two or three years and they have to be able to withstand the seasonal floods and any debris flow or other bed load movement event as well as predation by fish and dippers uh, and temperature increases and, and potential competition with filamentous algae which take over the rock and then they have nowhere to adhere so tail frog has a lot to, of things to deal with. The fleshy tails of the males is not actually a true tail but an extension of the cloaca which is a repository for waste and reproductive activity. The tailed frog is one of only a few frogs in the world that practice internal fertilization. This prevents the male semen from being flushed downstream in the fast currents. The males also develop black tubercles on the legs during the breeding season, which aid in clasping the female. The fertilized eggs are laid in small, unpigmented clumps under stones in the stream. When the tadpoles or larvae emerge in the late summer, they must contend with the fast-flowing water and many predators. They soon develop a unique sucking mouth with many rows of tiny teeth. These allow it to inch along rocks and scrape off the algae and diatoms that are its diet. Linda explains the stages of metamorphosis, the process from larvae to adulthood. When the tadpoles emerge from the eggs, they're about two centimeters long. They have a yolk sac and they're quite transparent and they don't have an oral sucker yet. And so they're very distinct. The following summer, they are about three centimeters long, three and a half centimeters long, and they haven't developed any limbs yet. And the next stage uh, is the development of the hind legs, and that's quite slow. First you get the development of the toes, and then the knee comes in, and when their hind legs are fully developed, they develop their front forelimbs. And once they have their forelimbs, they start losing their oral sucker and they acquire a biting mouth and they look very much like a, a frog and they start to resorb their tail over the summer so by the time they're fully metamorphosed at the end of the summer August they are miniature versions of the adults except that they might still have about a centimeter of tail to resorb to capture the tadpoles and adults Linda's team uses minnow nets and positions them below rocks in the stream where the tadpoles and adults are found. The frogs usually try to escape down current, but with some quick reflexes, the team is soon measuring and weighing them. Snout vent and mouth size measurements are recorded, then the frogs are weighed. Tissue samples are taken by painlessly clipping minute portions of their tails. These will be put through DNA analysis which involves chemical and microscopic examination of the genetic material in the tissue cells. Comparisons with genetic samples of the coastal population of the tailed frog will confirm how closely the interior population is related. Linda suspects there may even be genetic diversity between the isolated interior populations. Preliminary DNA analysis suggests that uh, the interior populations of the tail frog are a different subspecies, probably di possibly a different species from the one in the coast and cascade ranges. And I suspect that the population in the Moye might be also significantly different from the population that you find in the East Kootenays, just because they're so isolated from one another. And they're isolated by very inhospitable frog habitat, a lot of dry, uh, terrain with very little water. The excitement of discovering a new species creates welcome publicity in the scientific community. Even if the interior tailed frog population is found to be a subspecies rather than a distinct species to those on the BC coast, it is classified as a red listed or endangered population by the BC Ministry of Environment. Linda's research team has been able to identify several streams not formerly recognized as viable tailed frog habitat. This new knowledge will allow us to monitor these streams so that human activities such as logging and recreation will not destroy the qualities that make them attractive to these unique frogs.
Another BC frog, the northern leopard frog, has no tail or ribs and has evolved with only seven vertebrae. Both skeletal adaptations help lighten it and because its hind legs are even more enlarged, it is one of the premier jumping frogs. It used to be so common that it was collected in large numbers for students to dissect. Today, only a small number of northern leopard frogs have been found in British Columbia, and all of them are in the Creston Valley. Biologist Heather Way heads up the research team. So this is the only population that's known to be left in BC. Uh, there used to be populations of leopard frogs in the Okanagan Valley and further east up the, the, the Columbia, the, the, the trench. Um, recent searches there have failed to locate any leopard frogs. Um, the numbers of frogs in this population are fairly low. Researchers needed to know how many individuals were left in this isolated Creston population and if they were able to sustain themselves. A mark and recapture technique was employed that included locating calling adult males at night in early spring. I got a chance to work with Heather on this project. The leopard frog in this live recording can be heard among all the Pacific tree frogs by its grating mechanical sound. Using the calls to locate the males at night aided in tracking them for capture. Heather was able to identify individual frogs by hand drawing the unique combination of spots on their backs. With this spot pattern record, she can identify if the individual has been captured before or should be a new addition to her field journal. Comparing the capture records over a number of years would also indicate if the population was increasing or decreasing. It was also important to see that the frogs were laying fertile egg masses and that the tadpoles were metamorphosing successfully into adult frogs. This egg mass has begun to hatch and the small black tadpoles can be seen attaching themselves to the eggs. These remaining eggs form an important first source of food for the tadpoles. Heather will return in the summer to see if the tadpoles have successfully metamorphosed into juvenile frogs. She returns again in the fall with radio telemetry equipment. All of this is important, finding out what sort of habitat they need at the various life stages and where they travel to and from in order to better manage this area in order to pr improve the, uh, the condition of this population. One of the things that we've been using to follow the frogs around and find out what kind of habitat that they use is radio telemetry, where we attach a little radio with our antenna to the frog and let it go, and we come out and check on it every so often and see where it is. Much of Heather's telemetry work is conducted in the fall just before the frogs hibernate for the winter. By tracking the leopard frogs till freezing temperatures return, biologists are able to see the kinds of habitat they need to survive the Canadian winters. When Heather compared her early findings with others studying leopard frogs, she found an interesting difference that will be considered along with other data. Even though in the, the literature on leopard frogs from the east, they are known to be a, a rather terrestrial species and can be found quite a distance away from water, the population here we found all of the frogs very close to bodies of water. Uh, they tend to be more aquatic, more aquatically based than tree frogs or toads are. Um, we normally during the day when we find a, a frog it'll be sitting on the shore but still very close to water and when you startle it up it'll jump in and hide in the water. But still they seem, uh, they migrate many hundreds of meters across 
uh, dry grassy fields in order to get to their breeding site or to their overwintering site. With three breeding seasons of data to draw from, Heather is able to speculate on the northern leopard frog's future in the Columbia Basin. Uh, we haven't had enough recaptures to get a, a good population estimate, but there don't seem to be more than, say, a couple hundred adults here. Um, the situation seems to have been improving the last few years. We started this project in 1997, and there were very few males at the calling sites. This year at the calling sites, we, we are coming across more males. So it does seem that the population is increasing, but whether or not that's long term and how much the population is increasing, we still don't know. And uh, what sort of steps are needed to, to help this population. Uh, one of the things that we have been talking about is a, a transplantation sort of taking some juveniles or um, maybe even some egg masses from this location and placing them in an area where, where leopard frogs have been seen in the past, try to build up a, another population. Heather contemplates the future of a frog recently fitted with a transmitter. This only remaining BC leopard frog population is vulnerable to a number of human or natural occurrences that could easily destroy it. By successfully transplanting some of this population to former leopard frog sites, we would increase the species' chance of survival. This short-term solution may be all that can be done till we find the cause of the global decline in amphibians. Heather's data will be pooled with other researchers around the globe in hopes that their combined findings might solve this mysterious worldwide phenomenon. Reptiles evolved 345 million years ago. The Simoria has been identified as one of the first reptiles. It predated the large dinosaurs, made famous in Hollywood feature films, by some 100 million years. Unlike amphibians, reptiles developed eggs and body protection, which allowed them to live entirely on land. Their eggs could develop away from water because they were protected by a leathery, semi-permeable shell that retained moisture but passed oxygen to the developing embryo. Their skin was covered with scales or a bony extension of the skeleton like the shell of turtles. The scales and shell provided protection and helped the adults retain moisture away from water. Reptiles share other characteristics. They are ectothermic, sometimes called cold-blooded. They do not literally have cold blood. By moving further away or closer to direct sunlight or objects heated by the sun, they can attain body temperatures as high as mammals and birds. An important benefit of this ectothermic system is that not as much food is required to maintain body temperature. Unlike mammals and birds, reptiles can go for long periods without eating. Reptiles also molt or shed an outer layer of scales or scutes periodically as they grow. Some reptiles have developed the ability to give birth to live young, called viviparous. Many still reproduce by laying eggs outside their body, called oviparous. Turtles are considered to have shared a common ancestor with lizards. All BC turtles are aquatic, including the freshwater species. Except for egg laying and traveling short distances to other ponds or streams, they live entirely in water. The painted turtle is an example of these freshwater species. It has been identified as blue listed or vulnerable by the BC Ministry of Environment. Although it's found in a number of locations in the southern portion of the province, not much is known about its population numbers or reproductive success. The painted turtle periodically travels overland to distant breeding, egg laying, and feeding sites. This often means that it crosses our highways. Unfortunately, the turtle shell is no protection against automobiles and many are killed in these seasonal migrations. This adult was lucky. 
and will live to lay its eggs, find a mate, or return to a seasonal feeding site. We are left wondering, though, what will happen when its biological clock moves it to make a return journey. Elizabeth Lake, on the western limits of the city of Cranbrook, is home to a vulnerable population of painted turtles. Each spring, the females go in search of egg-laying sites that often take them across Highway 3, a major east-west route through the province. The numbers of turtles killed at this site was becoming alarming. The Rocky Mountain Naturalists formed a partnership with the Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program to try and minimize these losses. Art Grunig explains why the turtles crossed at this spot in the highway and why something had to be done. Yeah, they come up here and they, they uh, want to go up to the shoulder, up on the side of the bank there, and in the rocks and the gravel and lay their eggs up there. And of course they travel so slow and then there are people too that deliberately, have deliberately run over them. We can see where they were crossing on the shoulder of the road and, and the car tracks have come right off the uh, pavement to, uh, <laughs> to run over them. And uh, so this we hope will at least save the females and uh, hope that it does the job. The East Kootenai Coalition learned from their first year's experiment that some changes had to be made to the placement of the fence. So uh, we found turtle nesting along the, right beside the highway in the, in the uh, shoulder of the road, and we put the fence down here to, to uh, uh, take that area in, but with the snow from the snow plows and the salt, it, uh, we felt, felt that it was too hard on the young turtles, and besides that, we couldn't see where they were nesting. So we decided to move the, the uh, fence back away from the highway and away from the salt and uh, lay sand, a uh, nesting sand from here down about 200, and, about 200 yards. This is the main, the main area that they nest in, so uh, hopefully that will eliminate any problems with the snow knocking the fence down and uh, cars running into it and uh, get the salt the turtles away from the salt and whatnot. The East Kootenai Coalition noted the turtles' preference for south-facing slopes and loose soil that retains moisture, conditions that provide optimum temperature and humidity for the incubating eggs. They developed some guidelines for the construction. Well, we, we um, are moving about six, in, six eight inches of uh, topsoil to get rid of the roots and the weeds, and then we'll lay the sand in there and uh, smooth it out. We'll put the, the wire in now, next, and then we'll lay the sand up against it so the turtles can't get underneath and uh, get across the road again. And uh, they take about, takes about 12 inches of sand for them to, to uh, be able to lay their eggs and, and uh, cover them and uh, keep them, you know, keep them away from predators and whatnot. But there is a large, large uh, number of uh, the nests are predated by skunks and, and uh, raccoons are bad too if, we, if they're here and I imagine they are. And uh, I imagine an odd mink gets some too and, and uh, then dogs dig them up, people predate them too. The coalition salvaged steel fence posts and cut them in half as they did the four foot by half inch mesh rolls of hardware cloth fencing wire. The size of the mesh was important so that juvenile turtles would not be able to pass through and wander up onto the highway. It was also important to keep the height of the fence to a minimum so they would not prevent other wildlife's access to the lake. Heavy equipment for clearing topsoil, moving the many loads of sand, and filling it in were also items that had to be budgeted for. After the fence was up, the backhoe operator could begin filling in the sand to the optimum depth of 12 inches. One of the unique features they added to their completed fence was a turtle gate. For those turtles that had managed to get through or around the fence and wanted to return. Um, well, it's a one-way gate, so turtles can't get out of 
here, but if they happen to get out somewhere else, they can come back in because they'll follow a wall or an obstruction, and they can just follow along and until they get through here, and then they'll just pop through. Brilliant. With the fence nearly complete, the coalition waited to see if the turtles would find the new location and sand acceptable. As soon as the cold weather in June broke and the air, water, and ground temperatures rose, they got their answer. Painted turtles seem to prefer the twilight hours at sunset to lay their eggs. This female continued her digging and egg laying for over an hour, time that leaves her new eggs vulnerable to predation. When the eggs are safely covered, she will return to the lake, having been safely restrained from crossing the busy highway by the fence and coaxed to lay her eggs in the loose sand left by those concerned that BC's painted turtle needs a little help if its numbers are to improve. With this kind of assistance, it's hoped that the painted turtle will be removed from BC's list of vulnerable species. Lizards are considered by most paleontologists to be the first dryland reptiles. Modern lizards are considered to be descendants of the early Samoria, putting their continued existence on land at nearly 345 million years. The only other complex life forms which predated them on land were insects and amphibians. Insects are still a primary food source for most lizards today. Three species of lizards, no longer than 300 millimeters, have been found in BC. Many are autotomic, which means they can shed their body parts, in this case, the tail, if threatened. The separated tail continues to writhe and serves to distract predators away from the head. Like snakes, lizards use their tongue in conjunction with the Jacobson's organ to find food. Their flicking tongue collects scent particles in the air which are transferred to the Jacobson's organ on the roof of the mouth. Using this olfactory system, they can track and follow their prey. The males of both are also equipped with paired copulatory organs known as hemipenes. We'll see and hear more about them later. In British Columbia, the northern alligator lizard is found throughout the southern half of the province. Pam Rutherford chose this species to study as part of her doctoral thesis. The northern alligator lizard is common in its range and is not considered vulnerable or threatened. Because of this, Pam can apply for special permits that allow her to keep them in captivity and study them in more detail. We've included this species as an example of one of BC's lizards, but it also provides us a window into contemporary research techniques. Pam begins by showing us how she obtains her specimens. One way we find out about where animals are living is uh, using traps, which I set at the, uh, in rock crevices or along rock walls such as this one. Oh, look. So it's like we found somebody here. She uh, comes in through this funnel, gets stuck in the trap, and uh, stays there. And I can remove this uh, styrofoam, which uh, allows me to get at her. There she is. Many biologists come across questions that deserve further research when they study the written work of other scientists. Pam found that her field work led to an important question. It's interesting to watch how she applied her research skills and creativity to solve it. Um, one of the things that I uh, ended up looking at was, uh, whoa, sorry guy, <laughs> was, uh, and he's very fast, is uh, sprint speed. I noticed when I was out wandering around the field that uh, if you see one of these guys sitting out basking on a rock and you, and you, and you come up to it and approach it, it and it sees you, it'll bolt for cover. And usually it's never running more than a couple of meters. And I noticed that some of these guys actually run faster than others because some of them I couldn't catch and some of them I could catch. And I started wondering, 
what are the differences? And I was sort of wondering maybe if it was males that are running faster than females. And uh, part of that might just be because the females tend to be a lot bigger, fatter. And also, I also kind of noticed that I was, wasn't catching as many lizards that had big long tails, like this guy's got a really short tail because he's lost it and, and it's regrown, so it's pretty tiny. And so I thought, well, maybe I should look at this and uh, try and, uh, and measure and see if there are some differences and try and figure out what it is that makes, makes some of them run faster than others, basically. The ability to outrun predators was crucial to the alligator lizard's survival. To find out if escape speed was determined by sex or other physical qualities, Pam began recording several measurements. Uh, so when I get back to the lab, I weigh uh, the lizard and the sock and record that total weight. And then I take the lizard out of the sock And then I just reweigh the sock. And then record that, which is 14.4. And then I calculate the weight of the lizard by subtracting the sock weight from the, from the total weight. Along with weight, Pam also sexed each specimen using a specially designed probe that was inserted behind the vent where the body waste is expelled and reproduction takes place. The probe was inserted into one of the two pockets for the hemipenes. The male has two reproductive organs, though only one is used at a time. In this case, the probe did slide easily one half a centimeter into a pocket. Pam double checks by averting one of the hemipenes. So you apply some gentle pressure to the side, and if he's cooperative, then a hemipene will avert, and that's, you can see that white uh, tissue, and that's a hemipene, and he's actually got one on other side. And I can avert that as well. And I know for sure that he's a male. Pam suspected that tail size was an important factor to escape speed. To measure their body and tail lengths would require immobilizing them. She found that this could be accomplished by pressing them gently between foam and a clear plastic container. Then a line was drawn following the spine. The vent was marked. It's considered the end of the body and the beginning of the tail. Pam explains why regenerated tails do not provide the speed that unbroken tails do. Um, you can tell by when they've lost their tail, there's a, a break point here. The scales look a little bit different on the top than they do in the bottom. And, uh, and that's, that latter part is the regenerated port, part of the tail. And it's actually a different consistency. It's quite a bit stiffer than the original tail, which means it uh, operates a little differently when they're running. And it's not quite as fluid-like, so it uh, doesn't provide sort of that whip-like motion that the big long tails will provide. Pam was ready for the final test. She devised a unique method of measuring escape speed but first she had to put all her contestants on equal footing. So uh, the way to do that oh, geez, is by uh, bringing them into the lab and uh, because these guys are reptiles and they rely on the sun to, uh, for their body temperatures and their running ability is directly tied to how warm they are, then you have to bring everybody up to the same temperature. So that's what these little boxes are for. So. I, uh, I put the lizards in a little box, and this, this box has got a little probe in it. And so I can figure out exactly what temperature they are, and then they all go in this thermal chamber. Pam now needed to have a consistent way of measuring speed. After some trial and error, she devised a unique racetrack. When the lizards had reached the optimum temperature of 32 degrees Celsius, they were placed in the racetrack and induced to run. By timing them at start and finish during three races, their average speed could be determined. She found that the males were fastest and the pregnant females were slowest. Longer tailed lizards were faster than those with shorter or regrown tails. So lizards that had escaped a predator by autotomy, shedding their tails, had paid a price. 
When their tail regrew, their escape speed was reduced. To be able to follow them in the field and determine the amount and types of habitat they required, Pam used a special minute metal chip that was implanted just under the flexible side skin near the ventral or belly area. The lizards showed no discomfort and the small incisions healed without stitches. With a special receiver transmitter, the movements of these tagged lizards could be tracked without turning over their rock shelters and disturbing them. Pam also recorded litter sizes so that reproductive success could be determined. Alligator lizards are viviparous. They give birth to live young. These juveniles have been protected in laboratory breeding pens and fed a rich diet of crickets and spiders. Now they are ready to be put back into the wild. They will be released along with their mother in her original habitat. If they are successful at foraging for insects and evading the predators that feed in turn on them, Pam will be able to incorporate them into data that will assist us all in understanding the northern alligator lizard. The earliest fossil snake is 135 to 180 million years old, nearly 100 million years after the first lizards appeared. They are generally thought to have evolved from the burrowing form of lizard. The boa and python family have vestigial pelvic girdles, the skeletal hip and remnants of hind legs. They also have two lungs, though one is very small, while all other snakes have only a single well-developed lung. The snake we'd like to show you is the rubber boa. Like other boas, it's an example of the two-lunged snakes. It's also Canada's only boa constrictor. The BC Ministry of Environment has identified the rubber boa as a blue-listed or vulnerable species. Biologists are concerned that so little is known about this snake that unintentional human activity could destroy important habitat and threaten its survival. This is the uh, rubber boa. The scientific name of this is Chirina bote. Chirina is graceful in Greece, in Greek. Um, this is a, a snake for people that don't like snakes. It's a very cuddly snake. It, uh, it's nice to hold. It doesn't, it will never bite. Um, this is a, th these are true boas. So they're related to the boa constrictors of Central America and South America. There's two species of true boas in North America, and this is the only one that comes into Canada. And they do come quite a f ways into Canada. They're found f as far north as Quinell. This particular one is a female. Females are larger than males in general. And she's probably gravid. In other words, she's got babies inside them. This species gives birth to live young, as do most snakes in BC. And you can actually, they can't quite now, but later on you'll be able to feel the embryos inside her. Now, the, the, one of the main questions is, is related to where these things are found, um, what sort of niche they inhabit. And these are generally sort of a, a burrowing snake, and you can see that by the, the snout. It's got sort of a shovel-shaped nose it's got very small eyes. It spends most of its time either underground or it's active at night as well. <laughs> it's a, you can see it's sort of trying to burrow now on my hand. The rubber boa feeds on lizards and small mammals such as mice and shrews. Like all boa constrictors, the rubber boa kills by constriction. It seizes the animal in its mouth then wraps a coil of its body around the prey and squeezes till suffocation occurs. Bob shows how a young boa tries to defend itself. This individual was probably born last fall. And you can see they're quite large. So the mother would have given birth to about five or seven of young that are like this. They're usually a lot paler than the adults, and sometimes they look quite a bit like 
earthworms. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but if you look at this, it's got its tail sticking up in the air, coiled, coiled around, and it, um, it, it will do it even more extreme than that if it's quite frightened. And this um, increases its resemblance to the, to the tail's resemblance to the head, in effect. And this guy's quite scarred. You may be able to see some marks on the back here. And those are probably rodent bites. So they give birth to a few large young, and the fact that they're quite large means that they're well equipped to start out in life. They probably have fairly high survivorship. The male boas are smaller than females and display the vestigial or physical remnants of legs. All male boas and pythons still carry this physical evidence of their evolution from lizards. Now, this is a, a young male, so its uh, sexual characteristics aren't that well developed. But male rubber boas have spurs on either side of the cloaca. The cloaca is just a, a, the common vent for excretion and reproduction in snakes. And you may be able to see on either side just two dark spots and those are the, the spurs. Now it's thought that we know absolutely nothing about uh, mating systems or anything in these animals but it's thought that these spurs are probably used in uh, courtship and so on. Because we know so little about them Bob and his research assistants set out to determine what the snakes habitat requirements were. By carefully examining the capture sites along a series of straight lines known as transects, they created a detailed record of the nearby rocks, debris, and vegetation, an important first step in understanding this snake's needs. So when we set up a habitat plot, the center of this plot is the rock under which it was found, and what we do is we run 10 meter transects in sort of a crosshair pattern and then measure habitat along those, and these transects are set at a random compass point. So we're getting a um, sort of a random sampling of the habitat around the rock as, by doing this. Upon capture, some of the rubber boas are fitted with temperature-sensitive transmitters. The operation to implant the transmitter demonstrates key features of reptile anatomy as well as current technological advances. This snake has been exposed to the anesthetic known as halothane and will relax as it takes effect. Bob employs an assistant for this sensitive operation. Okay, we'll take another 15 to 20 minutes for this to take effect here. She's pretty lively now. Okay, it's been what, about 10 minutes now? She should be fairly well anesthetized. Here, we'll just take her out. So, she has no writing response. And you can see the heartbeat. I should be able to. You can see her breathe, and there's a heartbeat right there. So she's she's uh, breathing, heart's beating, but she's well under. So we just give it a bit of local anesthetic. This is just xylocaine. That's just to keep her from uh, sort of a automatic response to the the incision. that for a while. Okay, so we make an incision just near the belly scales.
Okay, and we open it. What we want is to get into the body cavity, but within the rib cage. How's she breathing? She's doing very well. She looks well under the anesthetic, and we should be ready to go. Okay, good. Okay, so there's the transmitter and the antenna. You see that all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just got a small battery in it, and as I say, this is about two grams. The battery's big enough so that it'll last about four months. You just take this tube fit the antenna down the tube okay and what we do basically is we run this tube up her body not sure if you can see that underneath the skin and then we just make a small incision where we want it to come out And that'll string the antenna through her body. We'll cut off the excess there, and then you can just pull the transmitter down into the body cavity. We take and we, I don't know that you can see, but you can just sort of tuck it under the rib cage. And that's it. She's ready to be sewn up. Just use a hemostat here. That's just means the 20 minutes is up and she's well under. So she's breathing pretty good there, Laura? Yes. Oh, she's doing very well. She's got nice, steady, even breaths, about 12 breaths per minute, and her heart rate looks very strong and steady. Good. And that's closed up pretty well. Okay, now we still have the antenna sticking out the side, so just snip off the end. And that's small enough so that it shouldn't really need a suture. And that's basically it. She's ready to go. We'll keep an eye on her for the next half an hour or so and make sure she's coming out of the anesthetic all right, but I think I don't see any problems with this one. You can, you can see her breathe here. She's breathing quite slowly. Oh, there, she's taking a breath. The heart? The heart's right here. Can you see that okay? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. The data gathered from these transmitter implanted snakes will provide valuable information. Receivers tuned to the temperature sensitive transmitter frequency 
will allow the researchers to follow the snake's movements without disturbing them and record their body temperatures. The movement data will help us understand how they use different habitats. Bob's preliminary data shows that they spend most of their time in forest openings during the summer, but seem to hibernate in the forest during the winter. The temperature data will allow the research team to determine what kinds of rocks and debris the boa needs and how they use them to regulate body temperature. All of this data will help in understanding this secretive snake so that we can assure the safety of Canada's boa constrictor. We have been able to give you a unique look at three amphibians and three reptiles found in British Columbia's Columbia River Basin. With the exception of the northern alligator lizard, they are all on either the BC Ministry of Environment's endangered or vulnerable species list. The Canadian biologists who are studying them have provided us with new information about the animals, the habitat they need, and the latest research techniques used to study them. So remember, if you see them in the wild, step back and appreciate the opportunity. Watch closely and the animal may reveal more about itself, but do not remove it from the natural habitat. They may be smaller than the deer and elk, but they too deserve our respect and support.